1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, you'll find these words. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I now want you to reach out and catch your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, neighbor. God's, got God's got your back. Turn to somebody else and say, neighbor, neighbor. God's got your back. God's got your back. Turn to somebody and say, God's got your back. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God has got your back. God's got your back. God's got your back. Praise the Lord. God's got your back. Say it again. God's got your back. Say it one more time. God's got your back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you believe it? Yeah. Tell somebody, God's got your back. Do you believe it? Yes. Tell somebody again, God's got your back. Yes. All right. Do you believe it? Yes. Are you just saying it or do you believe it? Yes. See, I don't know what you're going through. But by faith, I'm going to get through because God's got my back. God's got my back. Praise the Lord. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. First Corinthians or second Corinthians? God's got your back. First Corinthians or second Corinthians? <laughs> Amen. See, we have some Bible students in here. First Corinthians or second Corinthians? Amen. Second Corinthians. All right. Turn to your neighbor again. Say, God's got your back. Amen. If God's got my back, I got to be able to find out where it is that he says he's got my back. Am I right about it? So I'm going to keep asking you, do you believe it? Yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. God's got, God's got your back. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that, um, that we're on a journey and we're not there yet. We're on a journey and we're not there yet. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Praise the Lord. In everything. In everything. In everything. So we got to rehearse it. In everything. Give thanks. He doesn't say give thanks for everything. He says give thanks what? In everything. Somebody say in everything. Not for everything. There's some things that happen to you. You wouldn't dare give thanks to God for those things that happen to you. But you can give God thanks for the things that you are experiencing right now because you know he's got your back. Are you with me? He's got your back. Richard Nixon, our 37th president and the only one to resign, once said, only if you have been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain? Only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. I think at the lowest ebb of his life, when he had resigned as president of the United States of America, and he was getting on the uh, helicopter to leave the presidential grounds, you may remember he flashed a smile and gave the double victory sign. As to say, on this probably the most horrible day of my life, I'm not broken. You listening to me? Because God's got my back. There comes a time, brothers and sisters, where everyone will need God to cover them. Everyone will need God to, to shield them, to watch over them, to, to protect them. Now, when we say that, that I can not really appreciate the highest mountain unless I have been in the lowest or deepest valley, that really becomes true when I realize my relationship with God. I want to say that again. It becomes true when I realize my relationship with God. Amen. Can I say that in another way? It really becomes true when you realize you have a relationship with God. Are y'all staying with me? 
it's not just about coming to church. Coming to church, it only gives evidence of the time that I've spent with God. I come to church to, to grab hold of something, to encourage someone, to be encouraged by someone, so that when I leave here, I can show them that the Christ that I have has worked for me, and if you receive him, he'll work for you too. Almost everybody I know is striving to be all he or she can be. Even though you may have put your best foot forward, some things seem to aid you in your quest for success, while other things appear to hinder your journey. Now, even though we're saved here today, brothers and sisters, we have to understand that, get this, we have to understand that everything has not gone our way. I don't understand why people think just because I'm in Christ, everything's going to go my way. No, it just seems, it just simply means that while things are not going my way, I'm not going the way by myself. He's going the way with me. Are, are, you, all, are you all staying with me today? He's going the way. Listen, don't try to intellectualize this. Don't try to figure this out. What you want to do is bask in the presence of the living God. You're not trying to figure out what I'm trying to say. You're trying to figure out what he's trying to get to you. Are you with me? Are you with me? Now, we are always expected to do our best and then trust God to do the rest. It's not the other way around. We're not trusting God to do the rest and then we'll do our best. We do our best and then we trust God to do the rest. Now, let's consider some things both good and bad that we have to do. Number one, do your job. Do your job. Turn to your name and say, do your job. We got all kind of jobs in here. We got all kind of professions in here. You got to just do your job. You got to make your boss look good. You got to be on time. You got to put in a full day's work for a full day's pay. You got to do your job. What? Okay, you all stand with me? You're going to, you're, if you're going to be effective while on this earth, you need to know what you were created by God to do. I don't want to go too fast because I don't want this thing to go over your head. You understand? You've been hearing this same stuff year after year after year, and you're still, still in the same place. Turn to somebody and say, I'm going somewhere. I'm just not there yet. I'm not there yet, but I'm going somewhere. Watch this. No one knows what you and I have been called to do better than God who created us and called us to do it. Now, initially, what you're called to do is not likely what you've been assigned to do. Everybody wants to be happy, but God says before you're going to be happy, you're going to be holy. All right. All right. I know some folks that are naturally gifted, but they are not nearly as effective as they could be because they're not doing what they're called to do, what they've been called to do, or even want to do, but it is what they've been assigned to do. All right, all right. See, listen to this. There's very little that can go on in church that I don't know about because there's very little in church that I have not done. I know when the, when the floor is clean. It's not going to be that it's going to be dirt on the floor and I don't know there's dirt on the floor because, watch this, I have swept the floor. A lot of times, can I tell you, I slept the, swept the floor last week. If there's something on the floor, then watch this, it's my job to get it up. Don't tell anybody I told you, but this isn't just my church, it's your church too. So that if there's something on the floor, if I can get a broom and get it up, I think you should. Am I talking to anybody here today? Anybody working with me today? Anybody praying with me today in the name of Jesus? Yeah, 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 yeah. Recently I was talking to a young lady yesterday. She was an accountant. She loved her job. We were at the wedding. She loved her job, but she was not satisfied with the job because she believed that she was called to be an entrepreneur. Amen. Now, she has an assignment. She's an accountant, but she believes that she's an entrepreneur. She loves her job, but she's not satisfied in a job because she, watch this, is an entrepreneur. Now, watch this. She hasn't created anything yet, 
nor has she learned anything yet, but she's an entrepreneur. And, and I'm simply, I simply share to her, if God has assigned you to be an accountant, by being a great accountant, you just might become a great entrepreneur. But if you're struggling as an accountant, if you're struggling sweeping the floor, why do you think you should run folks who sweep the floor? I just thought, I just thought, I just thought, I just thought I'd throw that out. See, watch this. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9, 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. Whatever your hand find it to do, do it with all your might. Ecclesiastes 9, 10. Which means whatever job I have, whatever job I have, it should be, it should be the best job that anybody else is doing. If I'm going to be a chef, let me say something. I don't know what they're doing in the finance department. I, I, I don't know what they're doing in human relations. But I'm telling you right now, when they eat my food, all trouble will melt away. Am I talking to anybody? I'm saying, whatever God has given you to do, you ought to do it well. From the womb, children must be taught to pray and seek God for their earthly purpose according to his divine plan. But they must also be taught to do the best that they can do in every job that they've been assigned to do on their way to their specific job that they've been called to do. Okay, let me show you what I'm talking about. Homework. You don't just throw stuff together and turn it in. Now school is out, you need to get a ticket to read and practice through the summer. They shouldn't have a cell phone or a laptop and they're just playing games. That's not taking them anywhere. They shouldn't be sitting in front of a television eight hours a day. They're not learning anything. The stuff they're getting off a of television is perverting them. Somebody, if I got three people to say amen with me, they've got some homework to do, some housework to do. Talk to me about housework. You should not allow your child to, to live in a, in a, in a pig stock. I know it takes some energy, but every day, clean up your room. Every day, make up your bed. Every day, clean up your mess. If you made the mess, clean up the mess. It is good teaching. How are they going to be excellent on a job that they may not want to do when they won't clean up a room that they don't want to clean up? Train up a child in the way he or she should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. They won't live in a pigsty then if you teach them now how not to live in one now. Amen. They ought to know how to clean the bathroom. Am I messing with anybody's children today? Praise, praise the Lord. See, one of the problems that we have is that adults, we don't make up our baby. If as an adult, I don't make up my bed, then I'm not going to tell my child to make up his or her bed because they're going to remind me that their bed looks like my bed. All right. <laughs> all right, right, all right, right. Watch this, watch this. When we look at housework and schoolwork, and how about this, church work, I'm gonna mess, I'm gonna step on somebody's toes sooner or later. Because you may be having them do housework, but maybe not schoolwork. Or maybe they're doing schoolwork, but not housework. Or maybe they're not, maybe they're doing housework, schoolwork, but they're not doing church work. I'm not gonna get a whole lot of amens right here, it's okay. I'm prepared for that, okay? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. See, see, when we talk about homework, housework, schoolwork, church work, you know, stuff like that, we're talking about corporate callings. Someone say corporate callings. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about when, when I talk about corporate callings in church work. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, he says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So he says, the only reason I came to earth and died was to save us and folks like us. Praise the Lord, to seek and to save those that are lost. Now, in John chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, I'm going to read it from the New International Version. You can write it down, John 14, 18 through 20, New International Version. This is what he says. I'm already saved. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm saved. I'm saved. He says this here. I will not leave you as orphans. Now that you're saved, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. 
Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. Are you all staying with me? Okay, so the life that I'm living, I'm living this life, this God-ordained life because Christ is with me. Now, my wife says, he says, because he lives, I will also live. Now, in verse 20, he takes it to a whole new level. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So watch this, watch this. Jesus is in the Father. Come on, you all stand with me? He said, you are in me. That's why we're saved. But watch this, it doesn't stop there. I am also in you. So whatever the purpose of Jesus was when he was here in the flesh, now that he's here in the spirit in me, it also becomes my purpose. So when I go back and say the Son of Man comes to seek and to save those that are lost and he lives in me, that means that my job is to seek and to save. My corporate calling is to seek. Now, I'm, not a, I'm not a dentist. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a physician. I'm not a doctor of law. But my calling and your calling is to seek and to save those that are lost because we have a corporate calling from Jesus Christ who lives inside of us. I'm not, I don't have to try to explain Jesus Christ. Can't do that. Don't be scared. Can't explain Jesus Christ just like you can't explain the Big Bang Theory. I will demonstrate what Jesus can do. Follow me as I follow Christ. See, now watch this. When I say that, it's taking me to a new place. Come on, y'all working with me? Okay, now watch this, watch this. Okay, if Christ lives in me, just knowing these two verses will help me better understand the mission statement or the corporate calling of the church, particularly our church. There, is, there are, are, are uh, mission statements and visions all around the church. Get one and learn it. You have uh, a book at work that explains the job. Read it. You know why you can't put your technology equipment together? You got to call Daryl. <laughs> because you won't read the pamphlet. Are you all staying with me? So when I listen to these two verses, now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the Church of the Living God mission statement. And this is what the mission statement of the church says. To seek and to save those that are lost and to train those that are saved to seek and to save those that are lost. So I got all these people talking about a specific calling when God says, wait, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really as interested in the specific calling until I get you to operate in the corporate calling. And that is to seek and to save those that are lost. Are you with me? If you believe heaven is real, then you should never be satisfied with, no, with, with someone not going there. You can't be scared to talk about the God who has saved you. Amen. All you got to say, I'm changed. Yes. I'm different. Yes. Come on, y'all stand with me? Yes. I'm changed. I'm different. Now, watch this. You can't go to the drug house talking about I'm changed. <laughs> All right. To be effect effective in this life, we must do our best to perform our corporate callings so that we will know how to do our best at God, as God reveals our specific callings. Praise the Lord. So watch this. If you're a dentist, you first and foremost are a believer because you have a corporate calling and, and you're leading people to Christ that's sitting in, in, in your chair. Don't tell anybody I told you. You're scared to mention the name of Jesus. They're in your chair. They're under your anesthesiology. <laughs> and you scared, at least after you give them a shot, mention his name. <laughs> okay, okay. Because they're going to say, Jesus. <laughs> okay. okay, number two, get started. 
There's some things that God will press you to do on your way to your destiny. God, more often than not, doesn't give us complete revelations from the beginning, but he gives it to us in bits and pieces so that our journey will be a journey of faith and not a journey of sight. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, to a land that I will show thee. For most of us, it's got bad news written all over it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, this is what the New International Version says. Because remember now, it's a, it's a journey of faith, not a journey of sight. We're people of sight. If I can see it, I can believe it. Praise the Lord. If I can see someone making a million dollars, I believe I can make a million dollars. I don't even know how. I can't play basketball like Steph Curry. So why do you think someone's going to give you the money Steph Curry gets? It's probably not going to happen. But if you, listen, if, if I can do some of the simple stuff, because see, Steph Curry is only getting paid because the stadium is full. He's getting paid because our sponsors are giving money to the basketball team and to the NBA program. All right, are y'all staying with me? Watch this. You know those Jordans you wear? You are helping to pay Steph's salary. Well, not Steph's salary, because he's under armor. <laughs> are you all with me? Okay, watch this. So I gotta get started. The, the Bible says that God spoke to Abraham. He says, this is what I want you to do. Get away from your family and go to a place that I will show you. Get in your car and just start driving. That's got bad news written all over. Somebody say amen. You got to know that was God talking to you. Am I right, Brother Bamba? You got to know that was God talking to you because I ain't going nowhere if I don't know where I'm going. All right. So now watch this. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise Most of us are at a place right now that we, didn't, we never dreamed we would be. Amen. Praise the Lord. You didn't know your husband would be your husband. You didn't know you wouldn't even have a husband by now. You thought you were going to be a millionaire. You didn't think you were going to have to try to scrape up money to pay your power bill. Am I talking to anyone here? You thought you'd be running marathons. You didn't know that your hip was going to need to be replaced. Am I right? You thought once I graduated from college, the doors would be open everywhere and you had to send out 30 applications before one responded? Who could have ever made you believe you would be where you are right now? But God, he's got my back. Okay, watch that. Watch this, watch this. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 9, by faith, by faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs of him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. I don't know where God is taking me. Watch this. But I just know this, he's taking me. Can I help you just for a minute? You've been living, you've been living in, in desperation way too long. You've been depressed way too long. Let me say, whatever you're going through, whether you're happy or depressed, you still gotta go through it. If you're gonna be successful in this life, we gotta get started and do our best on, on the journey of life wherever the journey of, life, journey of life starts. Wherever you are right now, just turn your name and say, do your best. Yes. Just do your best, wherever you are. You may have, you may have a, a, a director, an employer, can't stand. God doesn't have you there to, so that you can stand the director or the, or, 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 or the person who's in charge of you. He's got you there so that you can learn some valuable lessons to move you to the next place. If you refuse to learn the lessons where you are, then you don't get to go to the next place. 
Are you, are you with me? You don't get to go to the next place. Praise the Lord. You may have a husband that gets on your last nerve. You better start praying for him. Because that's your husband. You selected him. And if he's a dud, that says something about your selection process. Hallelujah. Amen. Start praying for that wife that's got a demon. God deliver her. Go to the bathroom, lock the door, pray over yourself in the name of Jesus. Cover me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. 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 You don't have to like me either. I'm just telling you the truth. This is good stuff here, folks. This stuff works. Let me give you the next one. Clean your house. Clean your house. Remember your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yes. All right? Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, of our faith. Amen. With God's help, you must cleanse yourself from every sin, along with every negative person, habit, emotion, deed, and misguided thought. You can't get rid of your husband or your wife because whoever God has joined together and you said he did, you should be joined together for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health until God, by death, by death, until God separates you and you can't kill the other. When engaged in spiritual house cleaning, I must always consider, watch this, the inner me could be my greatest enemy. If I would just change the way I think, it just might change my circumstances. Armed with that knowledge, though I must run the race with patience, I'm also running the race to win. I'm not just running the race with patience, I'm running the race to win. And so, just like we must lay down some things that are not good for us, we must also replace them with some things that will bless us. Okay, let me give you this. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 through 27. New International Version. You write it down? I don't know why you all think you're that smart, please. <laughs> Have you ever noticed the kids when they do their speeches, Easter speeches, Christmas speeches, stuff like that? They get up here with no papers. They have one lady, uh, you know, Sister Jones or Sister Hardy, they, they, they have a paper with the words on it. The kids come up here with nothing and they start reciting. And I'm thinking to myself, these are some gifted kids. Because I'm telling you right now, I have paper. I, my stuff's written down. Are you with me? I don't know how they do that, but to God be the glory. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race, all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in, in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So see, we all can win if we go into strict training. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Isn't that powerful, man? That's all that's going to church. Listen, if I'm not going to get the prize, if I'm not in this thing to win, then why am I in this thing? I'm not in this thing to sit in a comfortable red chair. I can sit at home on a recliner if that's what I'm coming after. I'm coming to church because I've been saved. And I want to grab something that I can take from here and share with someone else that will lead them into a place of salvation. If I'm not sharing anything with anybody, watch this. I'm never nervous over the things of God. Ever. I'm up here right now and people looking at me and wondering what I'm going to do. Let me say this to you. Let me give you the mic. Why don't you come up here and let me see what you're going to do. 
Are you all with me? Amen. Once you begin to share the good news of Jesus Christ, suddenly you start studying more. You start praying more. You start seeking more because you know that more has been laid on you. Now watch this. Watch this. Now, as believers, we're in the Christian race to win the race. For that to happen, we must run the race intentionally. 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 Man, I should just take this mic and put it in your face. <laughs> we must pay close attention. Watch this. You with me? If I'm running intentionally and I'm running to win, then I have to play, pay close attention to what I'm watching. I've got to pay close attention to what I'm hearing, to what I'm reading, and to what I'm believing. I cannot watch no HBO and Cinemax and stars with all of that sexual activity and think I'm going to be running the race to win. No, no, no. I have not been removed from that long enough to be exposed to that again and not get aroused. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You can't listen to rappers cussing and think you're going to stop cussing. It's in your spirit are you listening to me. It's like, it's like being around someone who smokes. Even though you don't smoke, when you come out, you smell like smoke. So I say hallelujah. I just messed up your movie for the night, didn't I? Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. I gotta watch what I'm believing. So what I see, what I hear, what I read affects how I believe. Wrong beliefs weigh down our hearts, it entangles our feet, it distracts our attention, and depletes our energy. Wrong beliefs will take you out of the race. You're not gonna be able to make it. We must identify what our weights are and intentionally do whatever we have to do to lay them aside. Number two, we gotta be focused. Paul says we're not running this race aimlessly or fighting like a boxer who only beats the air. You gonna see anybody fight? And I'm thinking to myself, hey, let's just see the sit down. They can't fight. If you're going to hit somebody, then hit them. Understand what I mean? I'm not boxing like I'm beating the air. And if I really need it, I'll call air. That was good. Even though he's contained. You with me? We're running the race to win the race. Every day, every day, every day. I walk 18,000 steps every day. 18,000. Some days I can work, walk more, but I don't. I stop intentionally. Intentionally. I'm focused on the 18,000 plus steps. It takes me 16,700 steps to stay at 100,000 because at the, end of the, at the end of every day, you lose a day, and so you only have six days. It takes 16,700 steps for me to stay at 100,000. There are a lot of people that beat me some days. But only some days. And I'll tell my wife, let them go ahead. They can't touch me. Not consistently, you understand what I mean. You can walk 22,000 steps today, but tomorrow you're going to be hurting. And you're going to be down to 10. And guess what? I got you. <laughs> now, now, understand this, brothers and sisters. I don't always feel like walking. I don't always feel like walking. But I know if, if it's going to happen, I have to stay focused and I have to intentionally do it. You staying with me? And so it is with the things of God. The devil doesn't, start, doesn't stop attacking you just because you're saved. On the contrary, the Bible says, in this world you shall have tribulation. But be a good cheer or stay focused. I've overcome the world. That brings me to another point. We have to train. Serious runners discipline their bodies. They train by consistent practice to discern how to best run the races. I tell you, everybody's got a six pack, but we don't want to train for it to be seen. Stop watching all those movies with all those beautiful bodied people. Because you're not meeting anybody like that and they're not coming after you. Can I get three people to say amen? They're up here with six or twelve packs, and, 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 and you know, and they're and they, and, and the wearing bikini. Leave that stuff alone. That's not for you. Get those, get those movies off your TV. 
I'm trying to help somebody here today in the name of Jesus. That's not your world. So don't try to, you know, people doing drugs, that's not your world. Come on, people shooting up folks, that's not your world. Are y'all staying with me? I got, I got to intentionally go to the thing. Listen to the people using profanity and calling women out of their name. That's not my world. I can't listen to that stuff because it's going to take me somewhere. I don't need to go. I, if I'm not careful, I'll end up hearing a person talk about how he mishandled women and then vote him as the president of the United States of America. Is anyone praying with me in the name of Jesus? Okay, so when it comes to Christ and discipleship, laying aside weights and sin isn't a one-time thing. I'm almost done. Turn to somebody and say, he's almost done. Turn to somebody else and say, ouch. Yeah, yeah. It's not a one-time thing. It is a skill acquired through constant practice. You with me? You can, listen to, you can listen to gospel music every day for a week. But if you're not careful, on the eighth day, you're going back to where you were. Come on, are you staying with me? It has to be constant. Paul says, I strike or beat my body and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And I'm here to say, you heard uh, uh, Donald Trump say fake news? I'm saying to you, stop being a fake believer. All right. yeah. Yeah. What you see is what you get. If you're not there, then be real. God's not through with me yet. I'm on my way, but I'm not there. I'm not trying to fool anybody as to where I am. Yeah. Back in the day when they wanted me to preach, I knew I wasn't living the life of a preacher. I stood up in the church and I told them, listen, I am not going to preach because I don't live the life of a preacher. I am here. I'm singing a song. I shouldn't even be singing. Are you all stand with me in the name of Jesus? Now you can have all kind of people come to church and we want them to come to church. But the people that lead shouldn't be behind those individuals that they're leading. Oh Lord. Oh Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I shouldn't lead a group and I'm shocking with somebody. Back in the day when we would have a worship, lots of times I'd start laughing like I did yesterday. And my wife's mother, Momo, would say, you stop that laughing. I mean, you stop that laughing right now. And she started popping my head. I mean, you stop that laughing. You don't, you don't laugh at times like this. <laughs> and I had to really fight that because to me it was funny. <laughs> we were at a Thanksgiving dinner. And, and she says, I want you to pray. And, and, and one of the brothers said, we're going to bow our heads for, for um, a, a pre-sermon hymn. I'm saying, what? <laughs> Man, we're about to eat some turkey here, OK? <laughs> I don't need no pre-sermon hymn. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. All right. So, and so don't be discouraged. That's what I'm saying to you today. If you haven't mastered your race, holiness requires constant training. Listen to me. If you haven't cussed for eight days and you cussed again, then stop again. See if you can do it for another eight days. Holiness is training that you do over and over and over again until you win. You're not there yet, but God's got your back. So now to win, you have to do your job. You got to get started. You got to clean house. Last thing I want to give you, let God turn your scars into stars. Amen. Where you are is not where you're going. Amen. What you've done does not dictate what you're going to do. Are, are you all listening to me? Because you've been in one failed relationship or five, if I do something different, I'm going to count on God to give me a different result. I don't know what we go through sometimes. Had a young man, met a girl at church. They weren't, either one of them weren't that tough in church. But God, we take them where they, as they come. Then they left the church. 
and start fooling around with each other. And it didn't work. All right. Then I get a call. He's upset. He's going to shoot me and shoot somebody else. <laughs> but after everything broke down, guess where he came? Back to church. And I'm saying, man, come here, let me talk to you. What's your problem? What did the church do to you that would make you want to shoot me and shoot other folks? He said, it ain't the church, it ain't you. It's just me being me. See what I mean? If you don't do the thing over and over and over again, you're going to lose what you got and you're going to go back to where you were. Stay with me, somebody. Stay with me, somebody. I know I'm delivered, but it doesn't mean I'm going to always be delivered. I got to do over and over. All it takes. Yesterday we went to Chicago. I'm five hours in the car. For me to do 18,000 steps, I have to be focused and I have to intentionally do it, even though I don't want to do it. Are you staying with me? So I can't listen to certain music because it's going to take me somewhere. I can't look at certain movies. I know you got 12 TVs in your house and you got all kind of channels on your DVR. You cannot watch all those channels. As a matter of fact, if you have no discipline, get rid of them. Your kids come in the room, you say, stop, 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 stop. I want you to see this. What do you mean they can't see it? You're their leader. If they can't see it, why are you looking at it? All right, let me stop. I'm almost there. That's not the stuff in my, in my, in my, in my notes. Let God turn your scars into stars. Brothers and sisters, one of my favorite verses is Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say this to you. Say this to you. If you start listening to music, you can hit the, the scan button and hit a song you used to sing 30 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago. Next thing you know, you jamming all of them. Praise the Lord, talk to me somebody. You've been on a different track for the last 10 years. All of a sudden you hear that song and you back in that car. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we're gonna be glad in this day. Every day is a gift. Every day we should be grateful. Often being grateful is making the most out of the least. Now, I understand sometimes things happen. We can't control them. There's an automobile accident. Uh, there's catching an airborne virus. It's getting hurt on the job. The story is told of a group vacationing in Arizona. They spotted a cowboy by the side of the road with his ear to the ground. What's going on, one of the uh, vacationers asked. The cowboy said, two, two horses, one gray, one chestnut, are pulling a wagon carrying two men. One man is wearing a red shirt. The other is wearing a black shirt. They're heading east. Wow. Can you tell all of that just by listening to the ground, said one of the tourists? No, replied the cowboy. They just ran over me. <laughs> Sometimes, brothers and sisters, like that cowboy, things happen that we cannot help. But most of the time, it's not the problem. It's how we handle the problem that will either make us or break us. Am I talking to anybody here today in the name of Jesus? Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, he says, For I have learned in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. He said, I had to go through a whole lot, but I've learned the lesson. I know how to be abased, way down there. I know how to bow, be way up there. Everywhere in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Isn't that amazing? You would never think that that was the end of that statement. After all I've been through, I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know that God has my back. Now, we have to understand as believers, God will turn our scars into stars. The story is told of Corey Ten Boom and her family. They served the Lord by helping to hide Jews during World War II. Now, even though she was arrested and thrown into prison, her faith remained strong. They caught her because when you're doing right things, sooner or later you're going to get caught. Can I give you the other side? When you're doing wrong things, 
sooner or later, you're going to get caught. So they got caught and they threw him in the prison. Her faith remained strong. She tells the story of how she and her sister Betsy were roughly pushed into Barracks 28 at Ravensbrook, a work camp for prisoners. We started, we stand at the stacks of wooden sleeping platforms crowded into this large room, she said. The platforms were three deep and covered with dirty, stinking straw. They had arrived by train, crushed together for three days with 80 women in a freight car. Exhausted, they crawled into the platform that had been assigned for them to sleep. But within minutes, Corey jumped down to the floor shouting, flee, flee, this place is crawling with fleas. Her sister Bessie quickly reminded her of the Bible passage that they had read that morning, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus for you. Corey responded, I don't know how we can cope with living in a place like this. Let us alone, let alone give God thanks for it. Bessie says, think about, think about it, Corey. We have a lot to be grateful for. Hallelujah. Number one, we're together. All right. That was almost unheard of. Yes. Number two, the guards didn't find your Bible. For anyone who had a Bible would be instantly killed. Yeah. Number three, this place is packed with women who can hear us when we read our Bible. Yeah. And number four, Corey, let's thank him for the fleas. Yeah. Corey shouted, I would thank him for the other three things, but I am definitely not going to thank him for the fleas. The ladies worked 11 hours a day, but every morning and every evening they had a Bible study that was never interrupted by the guards. Days later, Betsy grabbed Corey's arm and whispered, I know why no one has bothered our Bible study. I overheard some of the guards talking. None of them want to come into barracks 28 because of the fleas. <laughs> As Corey prayed, she had to laugh, and then she said, all right, Lord, thank you for the fleas. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I don't know where you're going. I don't know what, what it is that you're going through. It may be keys or fleas. It may be health or wealth. It may be family, friends, or foe. But whatever it is, in everything, give him thanks. Because God and God alone, he's got your back. Give him some praise. Give him some honor. Give him some glory in the house of God today.